chapter 2, one verse, verse number 9. And uh, some would probably pronounce it Haggai, some Haggai. But he's a minor prophet, but he speaks of major events. And we want to talk about one of them today. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place, meaning in this house, will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Everybody say, God bless his word. You can be seated. I'll announce my subject momentarily. I want to begin today by saying that it's quite possible that uh, there are those in the secular world and even quite possibly in some circles of modern day Christianity who will find my sermon title to be somewhat problematic. They will probably uh, label me someone who is totally out of touch with present realities their so-called conventional wisdom and even rationale, their thinking would probably speak to the contrary of what I want to preach today. Because of human logic and rationale and even common sense, it would tell them in the total scope of human conditions, it will only worsen, meaning that the worst indeed is yet to come. And yet I want to rise with a prophetic voice today and remind us that this message, however, will speak a strong contradiction to prevailing circumstances, current conditions, and even ongoing issues that seem to offer no outlet for change and hope. I started to title the sermon today, A Message of Contradictions, because I have come today with a contradiction. Reason being, our God is in the business of upsetting the proverbial apple cart. In fact, Jesus is the master of the unorthodox, the unusual. The words normal and the word usual never figured prominently in his methodology. He can still work in mysterious ways that are nothing short of mesmerizing and amazing. Can I just remind us today of some simple and yet I believe profound cardinal truths that cannot be altered. It cannot be changed. It cannot be discontinued. I want to remind us that Jesus can still turn a woe into a wonder. He can turn a dilemma, a disaster into a deliverance. So in spite of present situations that may seem somewhat permanent today, I want to lift a voice of encouragement and declare to one and all in this house that the best is yet to come. Now they've got a message of contradictions and that'll work, but I'm really going to be preaching that the best is yet to come. I have not just come to preach to the corporate body, this local assembly generally, if you will, but I believe that individually that we can find ourselves in the message. How many need God to release some radical, phenomenal changes into your situation that may be tittering on something that's dire and threatening, but God is able to give a transition in your life. He can still give beauty for ashes. He can still give a garment of praise where there has been an old spirit of heaviness. He can release to you the oil of joy where there has been a season of sorrow and lamentation. I'll just go ahead and tell you, he can turn the lamentation into a laughter. He can take a defeat and he can reach into the very jaws of that situation and pull you out a most noble victory. What are you saying? I've come to tell you in spite of where you are in life right now, I am convinced that the best is yet to come. In other words, and this is Mississippi vernacular, I am from Mississippi, can I just put it like this? You ain't seen nothing yet compared to what God is about to release to the body, what God is about to release to local assemblies, and what God is about to release into somebody's life. You ain't seen nothing yet. Now that statement just simply implies that no matter how extreme or how impressive something may seem now, it will be overshadowed and superseded by what is to come. 
Is there anybody in the house who still believes uh, that he can absolutely do the impossible, the unimaginable, the unthinkable, the inconceivable? He knows the ending from the beginning. And the Bible says, in fact, it was the wise man Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 8. He says the end of a thing is better than the beginning. So if that is true, and I know that it is true, that I've come to preach to somebody prophetically to tell you that you may be in a dark place, but God is about to release into your life a beautiful sunrise. While it may be true, and it is, that we has endured for a night but in just a little while the best is yet to come in just a short time God is about to release to you a beautiful sunrise that's going to usher in change it's going to usher in beauty it's going to usher in power and promises fulfilled if you believe that you ought to give him praise today the best is yet to come I do believe woven into the fabric of this message today are threads of hope and promise of better things to come. Somebody said, you don't know my situation. Well, I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're going through, but God knows right where you are. He can put his finger on you. He can put his hand on you. In fact, I've come to tell you something that the devil don't want you to hear. God has never removed his hand from you. He touched you a long time ago, and that touch has been carrying you through the dark places, through the low places, through places and seasons of disappointment. God would have you to know that he has not changed his mind about you. That he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And just like the psalmist David who said of himself and the Lord, he will perfect that which concerns me. God will fulfill his plan and his purpose in my life. You may be on a winding road, but I've come to tell you it's not a dead end street. Because something more promising and prolific and powerful and productive is about to be released into your life. You've been on a path, but God is about to join you in the fray and lift you above the shadows. He's going to plant your feet on higher ground. Now, I may not be preaching to everybody. Some of you, it's obvious that you're camped out on a mountain and life has never been better and you're full of everything. But I got news for you. Some of us in this house need to be reminded that if God is for us, who or what then can be against us? That where we are in life right now is not where the story is supposed to end. Can I tell somebody prophetically today that God is getting ready? to add a brand new chapter to your life and it's going to be sweet not bitter it's going to be joyful not sorrow I am preaching today that the future is bright and the harvest is ripe Woo. I felt it when I pulled upon the property a spirit a power of illumination, revelation, a spirit of revival and restoration and renewal. Can I tell you the harvest is ripe and this church is about to taste and see that the Lord really is good. I feel an addition. I feel a multiplication. There's an increase coming. It's already obvious. I wish somebody would claim their family right now. Claim that family member. Claim that husband. Claim the wife. Claim your children. Claim all the prodigals. The best is yet to come. Out of the ashes will rise up a mighty army. This message represents a positive word about a powerful future. Really, Brother Crease, it's a message of optimism. We need a baptism of optimism. 
It's a message of hope and confidence and optimism about the church, his plan, his purpose for his people. See, optimism is just simply defined as hopefulness. Amen. And confidence about the future. It's a belief for a successful outcome. Now, that's optimism. And we are confident today when it comes to the church. It's future. We are confident that the powers of darkness, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church, past, present, and future. The church is triumphant. Amen? The same, however, cannot be said about the world that we live in. The direction that it seems to be trending. Our world tonight or today is in a crisis mode. It's in an upheaval appearing to be on a collision course for disaster. The eyes of the world today are focused on the Middle East, especially Israel, God's chosen people who are at war against those who want to annihilate them. These are dangerous and unprecedented times that we live in as the people of God. We must understand that while we are confident concerning God's economy, God's church, we don't hold the same optimism when it comes to the direction that our world is trending in. Amen? People today, let's just get honest, are less optimism, optimistic about a positive future for America and even the world, socially, politically, economically. There's really not a lot to be positive about. And I must concur with your pastor today. I'm patriotic. The worst day in America is still by far better than the best day in some third world country. Thank God for America and the liberties that we still have. As of right now, we still have them. I thank God for America. America has been highly favored and blessed by God. Amen? But we must understand something that while the church cannot be shaken... The church cannot be moved. The same cannot be said about the world and even America for that matter. Amen? And yet we're a part of a kingdom that is eternal. And if you keep up with the news, it can be depressing. It can be alarming. It can be discouraging. And uh, I get frustrated sometimes and aggravated and irritated. And there's a new one, aggravated. If you follow the news because you, you, you wonder what's going on. How can people be so wrong? How can they be so blind? Uh, everything seems to be upside down in their theology. And well, the Bible talked about it. That in the last days, men would not be able to discern their right hand from their left hand. They would call evil good and good evil. Everything seems to be upside down and backwards in society today. But I'm glad we're a part of a church that cannot be shaken. It cannot be moved. It cannot be discontinued. The devil can huff and puff all he wants to, but he cannot blow this house down. I'm going to talk about the house in just a moment. I'm glad that we're a part of something that is destined to win. Amen? You got to understand when we look at the world today, the current state of affairs, the kingdoms of this world will rise and fall. Governments and political parties, they will all eventually crumble, but the church cannot be destroyed. Can I remind you that the church is not in a free fall. It's not in a tailspin. The church is not going down. The church is not losing momentum. It's a triumphant church. Understand there, you know, as far as the church, the mystical body of Jesus Christ, there's nothing wrong with the church. Now, local assemblies, that's another story. There's no such thing as a perfect local assembly. I'm not looking to go preach at a perfect church because if I get there, I'm just going to throw a monkey wrench and all. I'm, I, you know, it's not going to be perfect any longer because I'm there. Amen? But the church that he's coming back for will be without spot, blemish, wrinkle, or any such thing. Uh, I've got great confidence in God's economy, his church. In fact, I've never been more optimistic, 
more confident that the best indeed is yet to come. I'm not here to insult our spiritual intelligence. I know many of us have been raised in this and we've seen great revivals and great moves of God and there's been many great uh, glorious eras in our rank and file of Pentecostalism but I got news for you. My Bible talked about in the last days God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Are we not living there? Then why not expect a revival in your church, in your family, in your own life? I still believe, yes, the world lies in darkness, but the church is a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. The church is a bright light in a darkened world. So I've come today with some contradictions. I've come to dispute evil influences. I've come to expose and denounce the devil's propaganda that would try to convince us that at best all we can hope for is a little here and a little there. Just a little, you know, sporadic outpouring. Just a little shower. But I got news for you. I don't read that in the word of the Lord. Hope is not lost. The light of his love has not grown dim. He is still omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. In the one verse that we read today, Haggai prophesied to the leaders of the Jews who had just returned to Babylon, or returned to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon. To paraphrase what he was really saying that day, he was saying to those uh, old religious heads, if you will, we will finish rebuilding this temple. And once it is completed, uh, it will supersede the greatness of the old temple that was destroyed almost 70 years ago. He talked about something that had happened almost 70 years before. The old temple was destroyed and, and the Jews were taken hostage, taken into Babylon. And then he comes back later after their release from Babylonian captivity, after their exile there. And he begins to speak as they're rebuilding the temple. And as he began to prophesy, the glory of this latter house is going to be greater than the former. He's talking to people that could only remember how things used to be. They were connected to the past emotionally. The past represented sentimental value to them. And they were trapped in yesterday, trapped in the past. They could only remember how things used to be. And I'm not here to minimize yesterday. Thank God for foundation that we're building on today. You've laid a foundation. Others are going to build on that foundation and it's going to be better. Every generation ought to take it to a higher height. Every generation ought to build upon the foundation. Every generation ought to see more, not less. I wish somebody would just go ahead and say, you better give me some room, Bubba, because what God's getting ready to do in this church is going to blow some minds. The glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. What he was really saying, I've got a word of prophecy for all of you. He was saying the best is really yet to come. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former. The former glory meaning the house in this house. See, Solomon's temple in the past 70 years before it was destroyed. And it was a wonder to behold before it was destroyed. It took Solomon seven years to build the house of God. Millions were spent. And yet the latter house, the second temple the prophet said, would exceed the beauty and the majesty and the glory of the first temple or the latter or the first house. Ecclesiastes 7 and 8, I've already quoted it, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Are we not living in the end or in the evening time? The shadows are lengthening. The sun is setting. The grace dispensation is coming to a close. Without a doubt, every sign points to the soon return of Jesus Christ. 
world events are rushing toward their culmination but can I rise to tell you in a day when world events speak of the signs of the time I believe according to this Bible it's time for the signs that Jesus said would follow those who believe is there any believers in the house today who believe the deaf are going to hear the dumb's going to speak the lame's going to walk the lost are going to be saved Yes, we're living in the evening time. There's no denying it. In fact, Isaiah talked about darkness would cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But I'm glad in that same time period, Zechariah said at evening time. Evening time. Now, there may be multiple connotations. You can study that, but let me preach it my way because I'm in the book. It's evening time. The days preceding the coming of Jesus Christ were there. It's darker than it's ever been. But he said in that moment, in that season of evening time, there shall be light. This is no time to give up on your family. This is no time to give up on yourself. At evening time, there's going to be light. Right in the midst of darkness, the light is going to penetrate those ominous clouds of immorality and perverseness. I realize it's a day of moral delinquency. It's a time of perverseness, but there will be light in a day of compromise, in a day of falling away, in a day of lukewarmness. In those same last days, the Bible says, but the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. We need to take a look at the wording there. They that do know their God, that means intimacy. That means personal relationship. That doesn't mean lip service. That doesn't mean convenient religion. But people that know their God, people that have a walk with God, are going to be strong and do exploits. It's just like the consummates a marriage in the Old Testament. It says, and he went in under her and he knew her. There was relationships. They knew one another. That's why many is going to stand up in that day and they're going to begin to say, but we prophesied in your name. We did many mighty works in your name. But he's going to look at them and say, depart from me, your workers. I never knew you. There was no intimacy. No wonder David said, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my heart. David was saying, I want to know you. I want there to be a relationship between me and thee. He even talked about a secret place where one would abide under the... That secret place is that place of intimacy with God. Amen. It's not just going through the motions of religiosity. It's not just coming to church at our convenience. It's not straddling the fence and saying one thing and doing another. But you have a walk with God that is consistent. Can I make a special appeal to one and all in this house? I think it's time for all of us to move up a little bit closer in Jesus Christ. We need something. We need a fresh encounter with him. Do you want to know him? Paul said, I want to know know him yes in the resurrection that's the power that's the glory that's the spot but he said I want to know him also in the fellowship of his suffering and those that do know their God are going to be strong in other words to not know him is to be weak and if you're weak you're not ready for what's coming upon this world now, I've come with a positive message, but I must interject and incorporate a little negatives. Some people call hard preaching negative preaching. He got on my toes. He's a negative preacher. You better thank God for a negative preacher then. Somebody that'll tell you what you need to hear, not what we want to hear. My flesh doesn't want to hear it, but I need to hear what I'm preaching today. I want to know him. Amen? The best is yet to come. I like John chapter 2. It's a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And it was there that Jesus suspended the laws of chemistry when he turned water into wine. And they take the governor, the water that has now been turned to wine, and he, he tasted it. And he said, we've got a reversal. Something's different here. He said, normally at this type of festivities, they give you the best wine first. 
and when men are well drunk. In other words, when everybody's too intoxicated to know the difference or care. Now, I've never been drunk in the natural. I've had a few spiritual benders. Been drunk in the Holy Ghost several times, but never been drunk in the natural. But, but, but they tell me you get a few under your belt and get, get to taste a little bit, and, and it clouds your judgment, and, 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 and you don't care. It all tastes good. Hello? Don't any of you blow your cover now. Just sit there like you don't know what I'm talking about. Hello? He said when men are well drunk. In other words, when they're too intoxicated to care. That's right. He said then they take out the expensive wine and they, while you're having a party, they'll slip in the cheap stuff to save cost. But he said at this wedding, you have the reversal. You have saved the best wine until... Now, I've preached it. You've saved the best wine to last. But he said, you've saved the best wine until now, and they're both right because the last was now. And I'm reading between the lines here, and I want to just preach it this way today. The very thing that I have already promoted and propagated and preached that the best is yet to come, I want to remind us now that we don't have to wait for tomorrow. The future is now. God has been saving something for us now. Now, now is the day of salvation. This is the acceptable time. I don't have to wait till next year or the next service or until there's a better preacher in the pulpit. All I need to understand everything that God has in his economy and on his table is available for me now. I can have a breakthrough now. There can be a deliverance now. God can heal somebody now. When men are well drunk, well, my wife was with me. She'd look at me and say, don't tell this part, but I'm going to tell it. She's not here with me today. We're separated. I'm in Tennessee. She's in Mississippi. We're only separated in miles. Been married over 40 years. September the 2nd, 40 years. Still in love. Well, that five foot four blonde. Hello? Now, I've never been to a honky-tonk, but I've been told they dance, they sing. There's music. There's drinks. Sometimes fights break out. Inside, and they take it outside. Sometimes they just stay in. And, and you got the old good old boys, if you will, that's chasing women. And they walk in, and... And some gal starts flirting with him. Turns to his buddy and says, if you looked up the definition of ugly, you would find her picture. <laughs> I'm being ugly. <laughs> but after a little while, after he's had a few, boy, y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'm not the voice of experience up here, but it's effective anyway. <laughs> and he turns to his buddy about an hour later and says, You know what? I've been thinking. She don't look half bad after all. And it reminds me of an old worldly song I heard right out of high school. I was working at a place for a while, and, and they would play that kind of music. And one guy was singing about that all the women look pretty. At closing time. So the governor knew what he was talking about. He said, most of the time, they give you the best wine first. And when everybody's too drunk to care, slip in the cheap stuff. But he said, at this wedding, whoo, it's the total opposite. There's been a reversal. You've saved the best wine until now. Can I tell somebody that's been on a winding road and your path has not been easy? God has been saving the best for now. Can I tell you? 
When you got the Holy Ghost, you didn't stop drinking. You just changed fountains. You didn't stop dancing. You just changed partners. Is there anybody in here that's glad that you and Jesus have still got a good thing going? That you found your oasis of love? That Jesus is the best thing that's ever happened to you? Oh, I think somebody ought to praise him because God is offering you something better than what you have experienced. The best is yet to come. I believe that with all my heart. Whew. That just simply suggests that even though things may be good now, there's still something even better that is yet to happen. Something more promising and powerful that will produce an even greater result or outcome in your life. It's often used as an expression of hope and optimism for the future. Let's be honest, sometimes individually it's used as a catchphrase for personal motivation, encouragement during difficult times. It's a belief that declares, when I'm tried, I shall come forth. It's a confidence that says, but this too shall pass. When you speak that, you're just going on record by saying that God's not through. The best is yet to come. Just always remember that your present situation doesn't have to be your final destination. Amen? I believe that with all my heart, and I've come with a positive. I'm not going to end on a negative, but let me just remind us that it's a reality as well that, uh, that cannot be ignored or denied that both inside and outside Christian circles today, multitudes are hurting. Amen? They're hurting physically emotionally, financially, and yes, spiritually. And I know that it's not always easy to look through the storms of life and see the sun shining again. It's not easy to rise above your environment, something you've been subjected to for a long time. You think it was easy for Israel to connect with a prophetic word when God is speaking to a group that he just brought out of Egypt that had been there for 430 years and their life had been anything and everything but nice and easy. Their life was made miserable by the taskmasters. And yet the Lord said, I'm going to lead you to a large place. It's a better place. It's a place that flows with milk and honey. You're going to gather from gardens you didn't plant. You're going to live in homes you didn't build. I'm going to make you above and not beneath. I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. You're going to be the lender and not the bar here. And somebody said, yeah, really? Man, that preach is good, but that's not reality. No, he told them, Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you hearken unto my words and you walk according to my statutes, all of these things are going to happen to you. He said, I'm going to release the blessings and the blessings of the Lord will come up upon thee and overtake thee. It wasn't easy for them to believe that, but as long as they were willing to comply and be obedient. See, I can obey him when I don't understand him. I feel things in the spirit sometimes as I begin to pray about things and, and it just it's all of a sudden a revelation that comes to me and it does not compute because it's the opposite of where I am. But I choose to hear and believe what God is saying, even if when I don't understand it. And sometimes a word comes your way, and it gets worse, a whole lot worse before it gets any better. But you just stay the course. You just hold on, because there are blessings coming, and it's going to overtake you. See, I don't have to look for blessings. There's a blessing looking for me. You don't have to run around chasing after a miracle. If you're a true believer, the miracles will follow you. These blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Going to run you down. Boy, I feel some doubt now. Hello. I never catch a break, preacher. If it wasn't for bad luck, there'd be no luck at all. Oh, you want to sing the, 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 the anthem of the modern reality. If it wasn't for bad luck, there'd be no luck at all. God's about to turn some things around. You don't have to chase after it. God is wanting to release it in your life. These blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Anybody ever had that to happen? 
I had that happen one time in the most literal sense. I was getting ready to leave a church service. I had preached, and I was backing out. It was at night, and I noticed in my rearview mirror somebody was behind me and I almost backed over my thought. I thought it was a child, but it's actually the pastor's daughter. She was older than myself. She's a little short lady, and she's trying to get my attention. And I stopped. She comes around to the window. I let my window down. She said, I know you've already been paid, but I just felt to give you this, and she handed me a check. And I thanked her, and I went on down the road. I got on down the road when nobody could see. Hello? That's what I thought. Yeah, money-hungry preacher. Bob says money answereth all things. Money's neither good or evil. It depends on what you do with it. Amen. Nothing wrong for you to have, nothing wrong for you to have things as long as they don't have you. Don't, don't, don't you look at your check? I wasn't going to wait till I got home. It was dark. The inside light had to come on. Now, I already knew what the other guy paid me. But I didn't know the check. She gave me, uh, here, here's an icing on the cake. Just felt to do this. Oh. Turned that inside light on. And I looked. Y'all want to know, don't you? Somebody said, I don't care. You ain't cared all service long. Don't start caring now. Just got your attention. The thing you're worried about is the time. I started to come to the pulpit and say, as the lady Elizabeth Taylor said to her seventh husband, I won't keep you long. But I didn't. Because I don't know how long I'm going to preach. But I looked, and it was a check for $100. And I was, and it still touched me. I got emotional. Because she didn't have to do that. Tears started coming. And then all of a sudden, I got to laughing because it dawned on me in the most literal sense. A blessing had run me down and overtaken me. I've come to tell somebody, thank God for the financial, but I'm telling something that has more value. God wants to do something with your emotions, your mind, your spirit, your body. I believe there's healing. As I was praying earlier this morning, it just come to me, let virtue flow. And I said, God, I don't know at what point in the sermon it's going to start flowing. But I'm believing that you're speaking to me that it's your will to heal somebody in this service. I've come to tell you as we stand to our feet uh, that God wants healing virtue to flow. I've got more preaching, but I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm not going to preach anymore here today. Let... Virtue flow. But the doctor said this, and, uh, and the lab work is this, and the test is this, and the ex I understand all of that, but I've come to tell you God's not through with you. The best is yet to come. You know, it's amazing to me that Caleb said 45 years ago God promised me this mountain. He was 40. Now he's 85. And Joshua was right there beside him. Had he been wrong, I think he would have corrected Caleb. Hey, Caleb, you're getting a little carried away. I know you're excited, but, but you know, you exaggerate. No. He said, I'm just as strong today. I'm just as able today as I was then. That defies natural law. Because an 85-year-old don't feel like a 40-year-old. Hello? I'm 63 and I don't feel like 43. Hello? It was a supernatural phenomenon. It was a God thing. So how do you know that God won't heal your body? How do you know that God won't add years to your life? How do you know that degenerative disc disease, that God can touch it instead of it disintegrating, it can start regenerating? <laughs> feel my Holy Ghost right now. Somebody ought to lift their hands right now and claim healing. <laughs> ah, 
God can take away the pain, the arthritis. He can take away joint pain, coronary heart disease. God can heal all manner. The best is yet to come. Really feel this today. God wants to restore somebody's health. I don't know, Brother Creasy, how in the world that lady with an issue of blood, after all that she went through, I don't know how that lady could have had any resolve left, any faith, but she did. And it's not easy to believe God for good health when you've been in a protractive season of bad health. I hear people, t I have people tell me, preacher, I don't remember the last time I felt good. I, I preached for a guy not long ago that's probably six, seven years younger than myself. And he said, Brother Sanford, I'm just being honest. I don't know the last time I felt good. Every day is a struggle. Every day there's sickness, there's pain, there's issues. He said, I don't even remember how it feels to feel good. I'm telling you right now, God can release to you a better day. Does anybody doubt that? No, I don't, I don't think you're going to wake up in the morning and be a teenager again. But God can touch your body. The very thing that's working on you right now that you may know about, you may not know. God can nip it. God can take care of it. And that cancer cell that's lying dormant, and for whatever reason, suddenly it becomes active. And then a little while it begins to metastasize. And in a few months, you're fighting for your life. I'm telling you, God can take care of that cancer cell right now. 40-year-old man that I've known since he was a child, picture of health. I was preaching at that church a few months ago, and they, they said, have you heard? I said, and his family, his sister's the pastor's wife. They said he had a, had a stroke about a month ago. I said, no, you got to be kidding me. No. He said he's not even been able to come to church. He's in bad shape. During that revival, he came one night. They helped him in. He sat on the back. We went back there and began to pray. Several people. And as I was praying, it came out of my mouth. I looked at him. I said, as you were before, so shall you be again. And for the first time, he was able to raise his hands. And people's eyes getting big. And he got a touch that night. The back door opened. Church had already started. And he walked in under his own power. Set toward the back. And the pastor looked at me and said, Two services in a row? God has started the work. And it was evident, it was visible that he was stronger that he was on the road to recovery. I want to tell somebody in the Holy Ghost today, as you were before, so shall you be again. Not just physically, but spiritually. I'm talking to somebody that used to have a prayer life, used to have a walk with God, but and you were raised in this, but but you've walked away from this, and you you've took this on and this on, and you've convinced yourself this is not. I'm going to tell you, and you long to get back to that place, but the enemy's told you you can't do it. Let me tell you that the devil's running scared. Those he fears the most, he fights the hardest. Because he knows that God's plan for you 
as you were before, you can be that way again. Spiritually, physically, God can touch you. As they begin to sing, why don't we gather in around this altar today? If you need special prayer, we'll pray with you. I've come to tell you. I said it's a message of contradictions. It's going to contradict the doctor's report. It's going to contradict what you can see and maybe not see. It's going to contradict a lot of things. You talked about a mess, Pastor. It come to me. There's a message for every mess.